Good morning. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Stephen Olson and to celebrate with you his selection as this year's distinguished alumni speaker. At no time and in no context have I met a scholar whose work so fully deserves to be compared to the achievements of the founders of his own discipline. Scholars like Max Weber and Alfred Kroeber, Ruth Benedict and Clifford Geertz, whose breadth made it possible for them to move with a certain deft artistry from the classical traditions of rhetoric and logic to the deeply textured approaches of cultural interpretation. Dr. Olson's contributions, in fact, reveal that he has been steeped in an intellectual milieu that eschews narrow specialization in favor of the broad view we call the liberal arts tradition. And for all the lip service we give it, nothing is so poorly understood or represented today as the ars liberalis. That is, the Western tradition which holds before each generation the habitual vision of greatness. The liberal arts education is concerned not with relative ends and the immediate adaptation of the individual to existing surroundings, but with values independent of time and particular environments. These include faith, reason, freedom, and the structures of our very social being. Dr. Olson himself may demur my attributions to him. After all, he is modest and self-effacing. Dr. Olson uh, is nevertheless someone I hold in the highest regard. Now I, will now, I will venture a few remarks briefly on why I think Dr. Olson represents the best of the liberal arts and why, for all of us here, he points the way to a reinvigoration of our somewhat neglected tradition. First, the liberal arts tradition sets before us certain models of greatness that have stood the test of time. This means that no one can be considered successfully educated in the liberal arts without immersion in certain great works. That Steve Olson has received this kind of education is evident in uh, the fact that in his, in his writing about concepts of sacred space, where he employs ideas with an acknowledged pedigree extending from Plato to Emil Durkheim and beyond. It is one of the signal features of this tradition that it seeks to comprehend the relationship between the individual and society, and that it views this relationship as a dialectical one, never fully resolved in favor of one pole or the other. It is important to know that these ideas have a history. We understand from this that great works are not merely of antiquarian interest, appropriate only to students trained in classical studies, but that they are for everyone. That is why I feel entitled to locate Dr. Olson himself in this tradition, since that is where he locates his own intellectual enterprise. Second, and related to this, Dr. Olson reminds us to look to the past and to the physical embodiments of the past in artifacts and records. Through these, we come to know ourselves. It is not possible for someone educated in the liberal arts to regard museums as mere repositories of dead things, since the things we find in museums are in fact the material representatives of the development of our own ideas as human beings. We cannot know ourselves without knowing them, and similarly, to forget them is to neglect or forget our own identities. Dr. Olson deserves high praise for rehabilitating Mormon historic sites. Without him, I believe, it could never have been done. But it is important that we recognize his efforts as more than just preservation, a worthwhile goal to be sure, but only one element in cultural memory. When we visit historic sites or view the materials on exhibit, we simultaneously re-engage the past and reawaken in ourselves the prospect of continuing the project of intellectual achievement and personal fulfillment. From this perspective, there is no greater error than the eradication of the past or the relegation of its artifacts to dusty corners or distant storage facilities. Third and most important, Dr. Olson shows us how the careful inspection of the past and its remains can be undertaken simultaneously as an act of intellectual curiosity and as a demonstration of faith. In my view, faith does not become less compelling when it is probed through scholarly inspection. We do not understand it better the fewer questions that we ask of its history. It is the opposite. Dr. Olson has always been one to ask the most stimulating questions about faith and history. 
These exegeses of the Book of Mormon concepts of space are rightly considered among the most illuminating in the field. But the quality of mind he represents came most vividly alive for me when we sat in a restaurant in St. George some 13 years ago and discussed over dinner the Mormon concept of deity with full attention to the theoretical concomitants you would expect in a discussion between two anthropologists. What was the effect of this discussion? Several things. But the most significant for me was the fact that it led me to investigate the church further and eventually led to my own baptism in the year 2004. I owe to Dr. Olson a great debt for this and for his friendship over the many years since. I will not take up further time introducing Dr. Olson, but I will leave it to you to judge how fully he encapsulates all that is best in the liberal arts tradition and in the exploration of faith and history. May I, on behalf of all those present, thank Dr. Olson for, his, for accepting the Distinguished Alumni Award and most of all, for being an alumnus of the Department of Anthropology. Dr. Knuckles um, appropriately predicted that I would demur. I, I hope um, you don't mind if it's pretty evident of my nervousness about being here today. Um, while I accept and will treasure this award uh, as a highlight of my career, I am still processing um, the presumption that I'm worthy of it. Most of my career has been spent behind the scenes. And I have to say that if it weren't for the invitation to share um, some of the deeper uh, things of my soul in this setting, I might not be here at all. Um, but I'm going to take the opportunity to share with you um, something of the significance of the work that I've been involved with for the last third of a century. That's older than some of you have been on the earth. <laughs> and um, I plan my remarks so that there is, will be an opportunity for questions and answers, the more informal and maybe the more enlightening part of this. Uh, hour together. On this occasion, and with your permission, I will try to make sense of my three-decade career as a Mormon historian. Specifically, I will demonstrate the extent to which church historic sites witness to the restoration of the gospel in this dispensation and express core elements of the sacred Latter-day Saint worldview. I begin remar my remarks in a manner that is out of character for me speaking openly about myself. I hope the, uh, these reflections reveal three principles of my character. First, like Robert Frost's woodcutter who met two tramps at mud time, I find both power and delight in combining my vocation with my avocation. I cannot, imagining, I cannot imagine not doing what I love and not loving what I do. Integrating my heart, my head, and my hand has been a key to my success and satisfaction in life. Second, I find what I do to be inseparably connected with who I am. The great, uh, the great anthropologist Clifford Geertz once observed that scholarship is part analysis and part personal confession. I hope that my character and my career are inseparably intertwined. Third, I recognize that who I am is also largely a function of my associations, particularly with those whom I have come to know well. Thus, on this occasion, I offer my profound appreciation, first of all, to my family, who support my career but never let me forget the value of eternal relationships. Secondly, to my friends and colleagues, who helped me to recognize and realize my divine potential. And thirdly, 
to my mentors and teachers who, nur who nurture my intellectual curiosity and love of learning, two sources of incomparable joy and personal fulfillment. My parents, Lloyd and Mary Olson, were particularly influential in my development. Among many other things, my father taught me to work, my mother taught me to read, and, then, and in their own special ways, both taught me to love, especially the Savior. The values of working, learning, and loving have been core to my life's greatest blessings. Therefore, I dedicate this lecture to them, even though today they are elsewhere working on eternal objectives. Speaking of my mother, in my early days, whenever she caught me doing something of which she disapproved, and that was not infrequent, she would bark at me in her gruffest voice, what's the big idea? While her rhetorical question was intended to stop me in my tracks, it also convinced me long term that discovering big ideas was both empowering and liberating. One big, one big idea has stayed with me since fourth grade. My teacher, Mrs. Stevenson, had a remarkable collection of National Geographic magazines, which she let her students peruse after they had finished their work. Being a motivated student, I was privileged to spend hours exploring the wonders of life revealed in their pages. Looking back, I realized that this experience engendered in me a strong desire to understand the incredible cultural diversity of mankind, believing that as I did so, I would become more like our Heavenly Father, whose children we all were. To this noble end, my formal training combined cultural studies, literary studies, and religious studies in anticipation of an academic career. For a variety of reasons, I chose instead a career in public history and applied anthropology. I discovered that many people engage in lifelong learning after their formal schooling with abundant alternatives, including libraries, museums, and historic sites, to satisfy their intellectual curiosity. The challenge of engaging free choice learners in an open market model became for me immensely rewarding. Furthermore, I cast my professional lot with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints for a loftier and much more demanding reason. In the restored gospel of Jesus Christ, knowledge is a means to an end, not an end in itself. The Church is in the business of salvation, not of information. To fulfill the Church's divine, divine mission, the products of our professional labors must bring mankind closer to Christ. Inherent in this gospel service is the promise of a grand personal reward. Thousands of years ago, the Lord told Abraham, these two facts do exist, that there are two spirits, one being more intelligent than the other. Thou shall, there shall be another more intelligent than they. I am the Lord thy God. I am more intelligent than they all. This passage, coupled with that in section 93 of the Doctrine and Covenants, equates intelligence with godliness. Intelligence in service of godliness has been one of the most inspiring big ideas of my life. Using cultural studies, literary studies, and religious studies in pursuit of this, this big idea, I discovered something really fascinating about the scriptures. Familiar words do not always mean the same in the scriptures as in ordinary conversation. Let me illustrate. The sacrament has been called the most sacred public ordinance of the church. As Latter-day Saints, we believe that partaking worthily of the emblems of Christ's atoning sacrifice renews our covenant of baptism. Thus, sacrament meeting is the centerpiece of our weekly congregational worship. The prayers of this priesthood ordinance help to reveal its meaning, particularly the many similarities found in those prayers. For example, both prayers use the same verbs to express the promise that we make in order to renew our, our baptismal covenant. The promise portion of the first prayer begins, 
that they may eat in remembrance of the body of thy Son, and witness unto thee, O God, the Eternal Father. The comparable portion of the second prayer begins, that they may do it, that is, drink, in remembrance of the blood of thy Son, which was shed for them, and witness unto thee, O God, the Eternal Father. While both prayers go on to detail specific realities to which we are to witness, the prayers specify that remembering and witnessing constitute the promise that we make in renewing our covenant of baptism. Thus, both sacrament prayers indicate that the complementary devotional acts of remembering and witnessing are central to our identity as disciples of the Savior and to our covenant obligations as members of his church. In order to discern what these two verbs mean in the sacrament, let's examine their uh, connotations of use not in our daily conversation, but in the specialized language of the scriptures. The term remember, along with its several variations, appears more than 200 times in the Book of Mormon, making remember one of the most frequently used verbs in the ancient Nephite record. Nephite religious leaders call upon their followers to remember as frequently as they do to repent, to obey, to pray, or to serve. Many servants and sermons and exhortations begin with a rehearsal of what God had done to deliver their ancestors from physical and spiritual captivity, and end with such pleas as, and now, O man, remember and perish not. As far as I can tell, not one of the hundreds of uses of the term remember or its variations in the Book of Mormon connotate, connotes a mundane, ordinary, or purely cognitive meaning. The frequency and urgency with which this imperative appears in the text suggests that remembering was more than recalling something from the past. For the Nephites, it was an essential quality of righteousness. Connoting core devotional acts such as keep sacred, preserve, commit to, embrace, and be faithful to. Often is in association with making and keeping covenants. Remember also commonly appears in prophetic declarations that God will remember the ancient covenants with his people as they return to him in righteousness. It is difficult to imagine an omniscient God forgetting in the usual sense such essential things as eternal covenants. More to the point, remember in these contexts connotes renew, revive, and restore, again going far beyond the normal way that we use this word. As used in the scriptures, remember enjoys a variety of connotations that are aligned with the mission of the Savior, the purpose of the gospel, and the plan of salvation. The scriptural uses of the term witness uh, are equally profound. The standard works recognize at least four types of witnesses. The most common type of witness is living witnesses, that is, men and women who receive from God and share with mankind sacred and saving gospel truths. Related to living witnesses are the records that they leave behind. Recorded witnesses continue as tools in God's hand once the original testators have died provided that they are preserved and shared. A third type of uh, scriptural witness consists of sacred places and objects. In renewing God's covenant with the children of Israel, for example, the prophet Joshua placed a large stone before the congregation and declared that it would serve as a witness against them if they ever turned from their covenant. Similarly, Nephite religious leaders preserved sacred objects such as the Sword of Laban and the Liahona, along with their sacred records. Finally, significant events can also serve as gospel witness. Doctrine and Covenants section 20 introduces the ecclesiastical order of the newly organized uh, Church of Christ. This revelation begins with a reference to key events such as the first vision, the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, and the restoration of the priesthood, 
which together inaugurated the restoration of the gospel and, and, and prepared Joseph Smith to serve as the church's first elder. The review of these crucial events concludes, therefore, having so great witnesses, by them shall the world be judged, even as many as shall hereafter come to a knowledge of this work. The scriptures often use the phrase, stand as a witness, especially as part of the baptismal covenant. Scriptures use the term, the verb stand in at least three ways that inform the phrase, stand as a witness. First of all, to distinguish oneself as stand before the judgment bar of God. Secondly, to defend the truth, as in stand against the wiles of the adversary. And third, to persist, as in as long as the earth shall stand. Thus the scriptural phrase, stand as a witness, implies that persons, records, places, objects, and events can and should distinguish the story of the restoration from all other counts of the past, to defend the truth of the gospel against all contrary claims, excuse me, and third, bless future generations of God's children as much as or more than those of the present day. In short, scriptural and ritual uses of remember and witness have specialized meanings. They reveal sacred and profound connections between ritual and scripture, between the past and the future, between inspired thought and righteous action, between covenant identity and eternal relationships, and between the things of heaven and those of earth. I have come to recognize that the hundreds of scriptural directives to God's people to preserve history and keep records are grounded in the sacred promise to remember and to witness. And I acknowledge how well church historic sites serve as agents of this covenant renewal. Sites unequivocally declare that the gospel of Jesus Christ has been restored to the earth in the latter days, that the gospel is true, and that the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the kingdom of God on the earth. Furthermore, sites frame a sacred narrative of the restoration that is qualitatively different from other accounts of the past, thus changing the nature of our academic discourse and our personal lives. Sites also serve as a permanent, tangible, and experiential witness to God that his, that his covenant people remember what he has done for them in the latter days. To this last point, I remind you that in the, that in the sacrament prayers, Latter-day Saints promise first and foremost to witness unto thee, O God, the Eternal Father. Thus, the church would be justified in preserving sacred sites of the restoration as witnesses to God, even if no humans ever visited them. From this perspective, it is not only appropriate, but perhaps essential that certain places have come to be viewed as sacred for a people like the Latter-day Saints who testify that God is a physical being occupying space, the eternal purposes of God are accomplished largely through earthly agents as authorized and directed by him, the restoration of the gospel in this dispensation consists of a series of events that have real world, spatial, temporal, material, and human dimensions that covenants define an enduring relationship between God and man and serve as a formal mechanism for God's children to realize the eternal blessings of the gospel. And fifthly, that the earth will eventually become a celestial kingdom for those who qualify to live in the literal presence of God. In short, historic sites are settings where eternal gospel truths were revealed by God to man and are enduring material symbols of the sacred worldview of the Latter-day Saints. In addition to serving as a witness to God that his people remember what he has done for them, sites also provide a powerful witness to mankind. The following examples indicate the extent 
to which historic sites enrich and transform human, human lives. Several years ago, I met a lady in Tahiti who was born into an LDS family but left the church as a youth and married outside the faith. As children were, were born to this couple, she desired to renew her activity in the church. Her husband advised her against doing so because he didn't think she could live its high standards. She insisted on trying, to which he did not object, but added that she try not to convert him because he didn't want to become a Latter-day Saint. A few years later, while visiting family members in the United States, this family decided to tour the Newell K. Whitney store at Historic Kirtland, despite the fact that he understood no English at all and she understood very little. At the end of their tour, he told her that he had decided to become baptized. Having understood nothing of what the missionaries told him, he had nevertheless received a witness of the Spirit and knew what that, that witness meant. He has since served faithfully as bishop of their ward in Tahiti. Secondly, one of my former students is now a professor at the University of Texas at Austin. She has a close friend, close friend who is a gay member of the church. Although he no longer attends Sunday meetings, he tries to preserve his testimony by regularly reading the scriptures and praying. On a recent trip to New York, he insisted that he and his partner visit the Sacred Grove. Afterwards, he reported, it felt so wonderful there. I could feel the spirit, and I knew exactly what it was. His partner, a senior faculty colleague of my friend with no LDS background, agreed that there was something different and profound about the place. Thirdly, during their physical restoration, President Gordon B. Hinckley occasionally visited the church's sites in the Palmyra, New York area and at historic Kirtland, Ohio. During these unannounced visits, he often took the opportunity for, more, for more moments of personal devotion at the Sacred Grove and in the Kirtland Temple. Prior to the dedication of the Kirtland Temple, he, sp he spent nearly an hour alone in the temple. Excuse me, I, I misread that. Prior to the dedication of historic Kirtland, we don't own the Kirtland Temple yet, so we couldn't dedicate it. So prior to the dedication of historic Kirtland, he spent nearly an hour alone in the Kirtland Temple, reflecting on the solemnities of eternity that occurred there. President Hinckley's example allows, excuse me, shows that when they are used for their highest intended purpose, historic sites can dramatically improve personal conversion, even that of the prophet of God. The last big idea about historic sites that I will share with you today is that sites and temples are among the few places in the church that are dedicated by apostolic authority and never relocated. I believe that this is so because temples and historic sites serve as bookends of the restoration. The divine promises of the restoration were initially revealed at the sacred places we honor as historic sites. And these promises are fulfilled in the, in the holy ordinances and covenants of the temple. In this regard, it is entirely fitting that President Hinckley was inspired to locate temples adjacent to major historic sites, the Sacred Grove, Historic Nauvoo, and Winter Quarters, even though none of these locations were centers of church strength at the time. Likewise, it is fitting that the church has restored several historic temples, including those at Manti, Utah, Cardston, Alberta, Canada, Laie, Hawaii, and Mesa, Arizona. It is also fitting that the church is willing to transform architectural masterpieces like the Provo and Vernal Tabernacles and the historic meeting house in Copenhagen, Denmark, into temples of the Most High God. I have come to appreciate historic sites as much more than destinations for cool family vacations, settings for non-threatening encounters with the missionaries, 
places for scholars to share their latest research, entertainment venues, playgrounds, and movie sets. While sites can and perhaps should serve all of these lesser functions, their principal purpose is to stand as witnesses to the restoration of the gospel so that all God's children, particularly as covenant people, can remember and witness to the power, majesty, mission, and absolute reality of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have devoted my professional life to document and celebrate the truth of the restoration as manifest at his church historic sites. I am grateful um, beyond words to Brigham Young University for helping me lay the intellectual and spiritual foundations of this worthy endeavor. I pray that historic sites will always help the church and its members keep sacred their covenant obligations to God. I invite you to obtain a more sure witness of the restoration by learning about and experiencing the holy places where the gospel was initially revealed in this dispensation and where it began its prophetic destiny to fulfill God's ancient promise to bless all the families of the earth. Thank you. So we have um, plenty of time for questions. And I would invite, or comments, rebuttals. There may be somebody who wants to offer a, an alternate perspective. Oh, come on, this is BYU. Please. <laughs> so what was your involvement in the restoration of these historic sites? In, in most cases, what I did is I managed the restoration project. So I call that applied anthropology because what I was trying to do is understand the kind of core values that led to the church's interest in these sites in the first place, and then identify people both inside and outside the church who, could, who, who had the necessary and expert uh, 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 skills to actually accomplish that purpose. So I was a little bit like either an applied anthropologist or the conductor of a, of a great choir that I had to kind of keep, keep going. That, that was my... And, and, and uh, speaking of that lady in Tahiti that I met, she didn't know that um, I, I helped to restore the new OK Whitney store, you know, 20 years earlier. So here we were halfway around the world speaking very personally about things in her spiritual transformation and my professional accomplishments. So that was really quite remarkable. Please. Yeah, I would say uh, in terms of, 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 of Catholic uh, interest in their historic sites, uh, there's quite a difference. Uh, even though those, uh, Catholic sites, primarily missions and cathedrals and other sites like Lourdes and uh, other places of uh, remarkable spiritual experiences, um, are important to the, the, the spiritual identity of uh, Catholics, there is, except for Lourdes and, and some of the places like that that are almost officially uh, um, uh, uh, pilgrimage sites, uh, the, most of the Catholic sites uh, um, don't have the same kind of meaning for, uh, for, Mormon, uh, for Catholics as, as church sites do for us. Um, I would say, looking f to an analog, probably the, the sites of Judaism are probably the most um, analogous, uh, the, the, the sense of covenant identity and, um, and, um, and spiritual renewal. There was a question in the back. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a, that's a really good question. I don't know if the rest of you heard it. What, what, are the, what are the methods that we use in restoring a, 
a historic site. And um, we try to bring all the tools of our respective professional uh, training, uh, historical training, archaeology training, material culture training, um, and so on and so forth. There's a, there's a, a, a vast array of different um, kind of academic and professional disciplines that we use uh, in, in the creation of a historic site because those sites really do reflect those different um, uh, 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 traditions, those different uh, disciplines. Um, so if we just stuck with what we found in documents, we would get just a small portion of what we uh, learn about our historic sites. But we use archaeology, anthropology, material culture studies, architecture, uh, uh, history, uh, and so on. Uh, and in some cases, we find that we, um, can I dare say this, we in the church history department are lacking a certain degree of professional expertise, so we go out and find someone who's actually a lot better in those uh, uh, distinctive disciplines than we are to, to collaborate with us. So, so historic sites are really kind of a, a multidisciplinary, uh, a multifaceted uh, 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 witness or, 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 or uh, uh, um, part of our truth claim. Is that, does that help? Yeah, please. Um, actually, uh, Ben Peichel's here, who's uh, a colleague of mine, can, can probably do this better, but let me start out. Uh, recently, the church uh, acquired uh, some property from the Community of Christ, uh, sites in uh, Kirtland, Ohio, and in, uh, and in Missouri. Um, they are not, um, if I graded sites in terms of significance, they're not A sites, A graded sites, uh, but they are kind of a minus B plus sites, uh, including a cemetery in the in the far west area, uh, a home of of Joseph Smith in Kirtland. Um, help me! Oh, oh, oh Adam on oh, excuse me, uh, uh, Hans Mill. Uh, what else are we talking about? Those are the three big ones, aren't they? And um, and we're in the process of designing a, a research plan to accommodate those, uh, to to really understand. Uh, what we've got and what are the, po uh, the possibilities of, of their preservation. Uh, we don't have specific objectives yet uh, identified, but um, we're in the process of doing it. That'll probably take a few years to kind of fully flesh out. Sister Brown. And, and another distinguished alumni, uh, Steve Young, you might have heard of him. He was a, a great supporter of uh, the restoration efforts at, at, um, at Historic Kirtland. Please, Roberta. Um, do you, how does that compare with 
Well, again, though, particularly Mecca and Medina would be like formal pilgrimage sites, and the church has chosen not to designate a- any of our historic sites as, as like a, 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 an, an act of faith. Uh, the, the other thing is that they are not restored in the traditional sense of, of, of uh, recreating the setting where uh, Muhammad did his uh, remarkable work. Yeah, there's a, there's a technical term in, um, in religious studies called axis mundi. Some of you might have heard that technical term. And in a sense, it means a place where heaven and earth come together, a point of contact between God and man. And, um, and while the ch- our church hasn't formally designated any of our historic sites in quite that, that is not equi- they're not equivalent to temples in that regard, I, as, I, as I mentioned, I think temples and historic sites serve as bookends to the message of the restoration in a really quite remarkable way, but somewhat different from it. John? Um, our LDS Church has both a forward orientation in revelatory uh, renewal and replacement, and as you point out, a, 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 an orientation to the past. And uh, those two can be, um, in a sense, at odds with each other. advocating with regard to the past when it may be seen as an obstruction to development of the future? Well, um, we've faced that challenge, um, but, but, but the apparent obstacles were only apparent. For example, I'm just going to share this one of, a, of a, current, a site currently in process of restoration, which is the Aaronic Priesthood site in northeastern Ohio. For many, many years, the church believed very strongly that the appearance of John the Baptist occurred down by the river, down by the, down by the Susquehanna River. The research that we have um, uncovered suggests that it was elsewhere. And um, so we went through a process. The church has a process for dealing with, with those changes in interpretation or orientation or whatever. And we went through that process, and now the first presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve and the and the um, department, the correlation department, have all agreed that from here on out, the story of the appearance of John the Baptist will reflect this new understanding. So that's a that's a relatively small example, but it shows that the church isn't so locked into the past that it can't uh, uh, anticipate what the Ninth Article of Faith said that that. God will yet reveal many great and important things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And that, that is a tension that can't, be re, that can't be reconciled in the, in the church and should probably not be, because I think that tension provides a dynamism that kind of keeps the church uh, alive and well. Back in the back. I think I can answer the first one better than the second one, but I'll, t- I'll try to tackle both. Um, I believe that collaboration is absolutely essential, um, not, because, not only because it provides a multifaceted perspective on this project that is actually bigger than any one of us or any one discipline, um, but in some respects also to manage this essential dynamic tension that exists in Mormonism. Some of you have read Carol Given's book about the people of paradox. Um, I, I think that is really quite insightful and compelling uh, perspective on, on Mormonism. And, and if Mormonism tried to kind of categorically resolve the, the, the internal tensions in its history, in its, in its doctrine, in its practices, and so on, it would cease to be as dynamic as it is. And therefore, engaging people from different perspectives and, and, and disciplines from different points of view 
uh, I think helps to achieve a much greater truthfulness and authenticity of the site than if we had done it otherwise. Uh, that's not to say that it's easy. It's really quite messy to, <laughs> to have this kind of collaborative uh, underpinning of, of the church historic sites process. But when we do it right, it's, it really is quite amazing. Uh, the, the brethren, just to, I won't go into details about this, but the brethren have been remarkable uh, mentors and collaborators to help us not only understand their perspective of the vision of, of the kingdom of God, but also to take from us, I mean, as they are general authorities, they recognize that we're specific authorities. You know what I mean? And, and that kind of collaboration is very helpful and useful as well. Please. Is there work being done to restore historical church sites in other countries and cultures? Uh, the answer is yes. And if you ask me this question 10 years from now, the answer would be yes. OK. <laughs> So there's one formal historic site in Great Britain, the Gadfield Elm Chapel, which served as a kind of de facto headquarters of the church for many years during the 19th century. There are other places that, which we're working with area presidencies around the world uh, to develop and, and expand and preserve. So include, I mean, the, the, the chapel in Denmark is, a, is a, an example. So there, we may not have the same kind of fully restored historic sites uh, overseas as we do in America, but, but we are looking uh, at uh, sanctifying, if, you, if I could put it that way, certain places as, as worthy of preservation. Please. One of your many ideas that's expanded my thinking and changed me is this idea that no human eye needs to see a res uh, restored site, a historical site. What have you learned about how to witness unto God through a site? I, I, would say, I would say part of that is to understand the story of the, of the restoration itself. That is, what were the events that, that made a difference in, in the Lord's restoring the gospel of Jesus Christ to the earth and being absolutely faithful to the communication of, of, uh, of those events as we understand them. And, and being willing to change if we find out that, it, that the story is really different. Uh, I think the Lord expects us to use our head in the furtherance of his work. The other part of it is to recreate the settings as accurately as we possibly can of the time when those events occurred. So when you go upstairs, for example, in the Joseph Smith Log home south of Palmyra, New York, and the... I'm sorry about that. And, and are able to witness that an angel of God once appeared within 10 feet of where you're standing. I, I think that's helpful. Uh, to the, the create, not only the engendering of testimony, but also the, the furtherance of one's conversion. So accuracy, sensitivity, those are uh, uh, an appropriateness. So for example, we don't share at historic sites everything we know, because there are some things that are too sacred. For example, if President Hinckley once said, if we knew where the first vision occurred, we wouldn't tell you because you'd probably just go out and ruin it. And we probably would, because we would be so, so enthusiastic to get there that pretty soon the natural setting would be destroyed. So, so appropriateness is, is also uh, uh, um, a, an important uh, uh, principle to follow. Are we about done? Okay, thank you so much.